Okay. I, I'm talking too much, Ronnie. I know. No, I you're got, not. I, talking. I start rambling. I go on and on and on. But hey, listen, they hear me every fucking week, man. You're the first <laughs> time you've been on. So. <laughs> you're not talking too much. That, that's the reason I got you on. And I, I'll <laughs> interrupt you. A lot. you don't have to do any work. <laughs> no, but I will interrupt you when I think you're not correct. <laughs> <laughs> Which I'm telling you, a lot of people who interview others do that. They can't take it. He doesn't agree with them. What the fuck do you have them on for? You know? <laughs> so, <laughs> okay. So let me ask you another question. Was that the only time you had any dealings with the Hubbard? No, I dealt with him a lot. I mean, I dealt with him on the Apollo, but not a, not a, a, a lot. I then joined the CMO in um, 1976 with uh, Ronnie, your son, and yeah. Biddy together in CMO CW. And right. At that point, I had a lot of communication with Hubbard directly via tele. He was in California. But then, ultimately, I went in 1976, I guess it was 76, eh, sometime around then, trained to be a messenger, like a watch messenger. And a watch messenger is someone that actually is with L. Ron Hubbard. Yeah. And... There was a particular, you know, it's like an apprenticeship. You got to go with some other already experienced Commodore's messenger and stand watch with them, meaning take one of the six hour shifts a day that you are actually with Hubbard, whether no matter what he's doing, whether he's taking photos, whether he's driving his car, whether he's sitting in his office doing paperwork, you're with him to run and get people, to run and tell people things, to pick up papers, to hold his ashtray, to, like, whatever it was, put his fucking socks on. Yeah. Um, and so I spent a good deal of time with him under those circumstances, which is pretty unique. You know, there are not that many people who in the history of Scientology have spent that sort of time with L. Ron Hubbard as a messenger. And interestingly, the large majority of them are no longer in Scientology. Wow. And quite a number of them are uh, speak publicly about their lack of a uh, lack of uh affection for l ron hubbard at this point yeah and you know saying, Karen and janice janice is probably the most uh the most well-known janice gillen brady and yeah she and her sister terry were two of the founding uh messengers and then lois riesdorf was another one and Dee Dee and Gail Riesdorf with two others. <clears throat> it's, mm. it's quite a lot. Well, what was your experience with them when you were standing watch? <clears throat> it was interesting. He had um, he was very quick tempered, like things would upset him like in a, in a flash. On the really? other hand, he had a pretty good sense of humor. It wasn't, he, he he was funny. He cracked jokes. He was. <laughs> he, look, L. Ron Hubbard was larger than life. I don't care who you are or what you think of him. He was a personality that was larger than life. I mean, <laughs> he, walked, he walked into a room and you knew he walked into the room. He mm. was like one of these huge personalities that is the center of everybody's attention and wants to be the center of everybody's attention and talks about things like in a way that everybody should be listening to him and he's used to everybody listening to him. And wow. he would expound upon everything and anything. I mean, you've listened to a lot of Hubbard's lectures, right? Oh, absolutely. What I'm talking about. Like the, well... I was, you know, on the dark side of Mars is blah, 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 blah. Or on 
and and the the subjects range from how do you cook a steak or how do you change the oil in a car to what's the nature of the universe to how do you send a rocket to the moon to how do you do underwater scuba diving to i mean he expounded as an expert on everything wow and, and whether he was or not is a different question but when you're in the mindset of as i was at the time this is the guy who discovered that you are a a, a an immortal spiritual being and will be able to you know attain godlike status and re and return yourself to to uh, being a, a spiritual being uh, uh, with powers and abilities far beyond those of mortal men, if you just do what I sit, tell you to do, this is is quite astonishing to yeah. sit with someone <clears throat> or, or be with someone who knows everything about everything. And you believe it at the time. I literally believed it. I believed that if he told me that there was a, uh, you know, uh, the World Bank was composed of six men who were descendants of an alien space invader force. I would have believed it. Yeah. No. And and it, it's hard to quite get a grip on that now, but. It was very. Uh, it, it was very electrifying being around him. Yeah, he he was a, a an electrifying personality, and you know you were on your toes all the time, and you know you're also worried that he was able to perceive things that nobody else was able to perceive, like yeah. even your thoughts and what you were planning and what your intentions were and et cetera, et cetera. So it's like a, it's like a, an, a very interesting experience. <laughs> I'll bet it was. And I'll tell you, I, I can understand how you felt because I mean, mind you, I didn't get in Scientology till I was 33 years old, but I did develop that mindset that I believed everything that he said. And uh, it, it takes a little bit of doing to look in the mirror one day and say, Hey, wait a minute. I, I think I've been, I've been fooled is the the mild word conned would be the real word you know fucked and, uh, could be another word what's that fucked could be another yeah. word oh yeah yeah <laughs> oh yeah but you have to come to that awareness to get out of that because these little datums or truths quote unquote that you accept uh you built up a kind of a template in your mind and you operate within that template which is actually a prison in your own mind that keeps you locked in to believing that what you're doing is going to help everybody and you don't want to get out of it because you'd be in treason to mankind kind of you know yes absolutely mm. i mean it's why larry wright's book you know going clear the prison of belief yeah and it and that it's hard to get people to understand that yeah. You know, you can put up fences and put razor wire on them and have guards and cameras and motion sensors and detectors, et cetera, et cetera. But ultimately, the thing that keeps people where they are is in their head, exactly. not the physical. Because if you get out of the mindset, you can escape, and you're proof of that, and I'm proof of that, and yep. Tom and Amy and your son Ronnie, and like everybody has proven that it's possible. Yeah. If your mind gets shaken loose. That's exactly right. And that's where I had to come to the conclusion. Of course, you didn't, and all of us did. Mark Headley, Claire Headley. And uh, it's interesting, though that your experience with him was so, as you called it, electrifying, because there are people, well, okay, I'm not going to get into my opinion because this is your show at this point. I, I'm glad, I'm glad we brought it wow. up. Though. So what am I, what am I doing next week? Who am I interviewing next week? <laughs> <laughs> no. Hey, no, I got you on to hear what you have to say. Oh, I get it. 
Okay, there you go. I misunderstood you there. I thought you were, I thought you were turning over to me. No, no. I can't play the trumpet. I'm That's learning right. to play the piano, Ron. Well, I'll tell you what I'm going to do. I'm, Ron, gonna... I'm taking piano lessons. Oh, really? I'm serious. I'm oh. dead serious. I am taking piano lessons because my biggest regret from my childhood is that I didn't learn to play a musical instrument. I actually have two. I didn't and, learn to play a musical instrument, and I didn't learn to speak another language fluently. Well, I can tell you, the piano is the perfect instrument because you can see chord formations where your fingers are on the keys. I, and I think that's a big advantage to somebody who just plays a single note instrument. You follow me, Mike? Yeah, I do. Like, I so do. you're seeing the melody. I, I'm, re I'm really crappy, Ron. But that it, it's like I practice and I'm trying to learn and I like I, I started like three weeks ago. Not no, keep practicing. And here's what to do as an example: if you're going to learn how to play a scale, do it like this. And then do it this way, slower. Like that. Two people not knowing each other told me that datum. If you want to learn how to play something, play it slow, slower and slower yet. And you'll learn it faster than by trying to play it at the tempo it was written at. Gotcha. I'll, I'll, I'll put, that, put yeah. that wonderful advice to use. It, it, it's mind boggling because you're a fast thinking person. And to be doing it slow, you think I'm wasting my time. You're not. But I'm going to tell you what I'm going to do. We're going to have a little cultural enrichment time here right now, okay? And I'm going to teach you how to play the trumpet. No, thanks. No, I'm going to teach our audience. You ready? Here's what you do. You blow in here and you press these up and down, and that's how you play a trumpet. So now the next time, uh, you know, the musician union call for a trumpet player, you can get a gig and make some extra money. So watch you go. show. you're going to learn skills, you know? I, now I know how to play the trumpet. You got it. Okay. Absolutely. Okay. Back to back on planet Earth. Here we go. <laughs> okay. Now let's switch over a little bit to, and I, I wouldn't call him the successor, but the guy who took over for when when Elron Hubbard died. When was the first time you met David? Um, whenever he first joined the Sea Org, I guess that was like 1976 or five or something. At well, it was five. 76 because he joined when he was 16 years old. Okay, 1976 when he first arrived because at that time, okay, at the time I was, had been appointed by L. Ron Hubbard as the external comm aide. I was in charge of all of the telex traffic and all of the mail freight in Scientology. There was this thing called the LRH External Com or LEC. And that was the little unit of people who delivered communications to Hubbard. At the time, Hubbard was living in Dunedin, just north of Clearwater, right. in an apartment complex called the King Arthur Courts. It's still there. Nobody knew where Hubbard was. It was all a big secret. He was like always very secret about where he was. But the little LRH external comm unit would, would package up these little packages and then someone would come and collect them and take them to him. Like one of the messengers or Mike Douglas or various other people. Dave was assigned to that unit. That unit was next door to the external comm. There was a connecting door. So I first met him when he was working in LRH external comm. Wow. I didn't even know he worked in external comm. Well, it was sort of the, it was part of the personal office of LRH or the CMO. I don't even know how, how it was organized, but yeah, it was, it was just, it was like the flunky level start out position for someone who ultimately was going to end up in the Commodore's messenger office. Mm. Well, how was he when you first met him? Um, <clears throat> I don't have like a much of a recollection of that time. Just he was sort of a nobody at the point at that point. Yeah. Um, you know, I knew 
I knew and became very, very close friends, as you know, with with your son Ron. Yeah, I know that. And I and I was always much closer to Ronnie, as I always called him. You know, now I call you Ronnie sometimes, but I, it was always you were always Ron, and he was always Ronnie to yeah. me. And I was. Um, uh, you know, my growing interaction with Dave really happened because of my friendship with Ronnie rather than interaction on, po you know, like, like interaction yeah. due to our, our positions in Scientology. So yeah. I came to know him and, you know, to begin with, he was like Ronnie's little brother. Yeah, <laughs> <You're true. laughs> I mean, that was kind of how I knew him. Was he was like Ronnie's little brother guy, and yeah. and then he went to CMO. In, Dave went to CMO International, and I was in uh, the Commodore's Messenger of Clearwater, and he then started being kind of in a senior position to me. Yeah, and that was when he started being an asshole. Really, like when he went to CMO International, like. He originally went and was on the film, the shoot crew, and blah, 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 blah. But when he became the action chief of CMO International was when he started really becoming the assertive, um, forceful personality on display that ultimately grew as time went by. Yeah. Yeah, I guess that's when he started to get some power because I've often mentioned yeah. it on the show. As a matter of fact, I mentioned in my book that, and you know, Lord Acton, I quote the guy who came up with this statement because it's worthy to give credit. He said, uh, power tends to corrupt and absolute power corrupts absolutely. And the, the, I, there's never been a truer datum that I've ever heard in my life because it's observable, not only with David, but with other people. Oh, yeah. Just yeah. absolutely. Yes, absolutely. And and you know, I don't I didn't know Dave when he was a kid, and I don't know and understand all of the things that de develop in someone or what factors go into creating their personalities, but I do know without a doubt that his personality type is today a sociopath. Yeah. He is a sociopath. I've read the books on it. I'm not a psychiatrist. I'm not a psychologist. But I've read enough books and articles that I check off the characteristics and yep. go, yep, that that is that describes him to a T. Yeah. Was he always like that? I don't know. I remember you telling me stories about what he was like when he was a kid and how sick he was and, you know, that he always – uh was you know small and kind of fighting to be um to be like everybody else and and be accepted or in the football team the same as everybody else etc cetera, etc cetera. and i you know I, I i don't know and i don't care to really try and figure out or analyze how he came to be what he is i believe that there are some fundamental personality traits that people just have. I also believe that Dave is the perfect product of the think and attitude of L. Ron Hubbard. Wow. I think he epitomizes what Hubbard describes and lays out as the ideal Sea Org member. Wow. Give, give expand on that a little bit because this is a, a a major point. You know that what you're bringing up now, this is something that nobody has brought up before, Mike. Really? Because, yeah. Oh, yeah. Because to say that he is the ideal Sea Org member, that would be, yeah, that that's like a new thought on this program. Okay. Just well, go a little description. It, it, what I mean by that, Ron, is that he epitomizes the characteristics that Hubbard said were so important to leadership, to 
being a Sea Org member to commanding respect to uh, controlling your environment. And, and those concepts are, are Hubbard concepts that are very, very ingrained into at least life in the Sea Org. I mean, you're supposed to be tough. You're supposed to not care about people's excuses or worry about whether they they can or can't do a job they're just supposed to be expected to do it there there's no empathy i, I mean no empathy is a, a condition that hubbard believed was a very very pro-survival state of affairs like if you don't have empathy or sympathy you are more likely to be surviving than the person that has sympathy and empathy and in the sea org that everything about scientology all the things that are like the worst parts of scientology are distilled into the sea org the sea org is where you rise to the top based on your ruthlessness your willingness to forego everything else about life, family, friends, other interests or hobbies, desire, anything that takes away from that very narrow focus of I am going to achieve the objectives of Scientology is unacceptable in the seal. And the more you are able to be focused like that, the more the better seal member you are. The more you're able to to uh, have an enormous number of the characteristics of a sociopath, the better you are as a Sea Org member. Ronnie, wow. if you go look down the list of characteristics of a sociopath, the standard characteristics, you know, they never feel blame. They, ne they don't uh, regret their decisions. The da -da -da, like all of these things, you will see that those are the things that are held up as being, this is what a good Sea Org member is. And that's Mike, what it is. Mike, I'm telling you, you're 100% right. I, I never entertained that exact thought. That's, uh, that is a new thought. And uh, wow. There you go. Come to me for new thoughts. Oh, boy, I'll tell you, man. But it, it's, it's true, though. And like if you were to read antisocial characteristics or i like the martha stout book the one yeah. sociopath next door that's because brilliant the, i know and the one thing she has in there that is not in hubbard's writings is that the sociopath does not have a conscience right and and that is the one marker that if you can spot that in somebody watch it you will liable to get fucked over by this person right and ronnie i'm telling you Sea Org members are not supposed to have consciences. I know. That's why I'm saying. Look, I I was in there. It's not like I read about this some fucking place. All right. So I I know what you're talking about is true, but it's a it's a brand new look at it. You know, I'm going to tell you something, Mike. We're running into the witching hour here, and I want to take up some subjects that I don't want to. You know, just say a couple words. Have you say a couple words about them? Please, could I have you back? Of course, Ronnie. I, I, I love talking to you. You know, when we get on the phone, it goes sometimes. <laughs> okay. Sometimes. Because I'll tell you, I want to find out how you got into OSA, how you right. became the international spokesman, your yeah. thoughts on uh, the tax free exemption that the church got, and about disconnection. There's a lot of things I'd like to cover, but I want to give you the time to go over them because this has been very enlightening for me personally and for our audience. It's, it's a real present. It's a a real gift that you brought up here that I got you on. And uh, I'll, I'll take full credit for getting you on. <laughs> okay, I'm, my producer is trying to get my attention. What's up, Sean? Yeah, a couple questions. We have a couple questions. Do you mind, Mike? No. Okay, go on. Okay, um, so FYT for $5 says um, he wanted to know about David Miscavige's daily life. Uh, what does Where does he live? Who's his entourage? Things like that. Do you want to handle that, Mike? You can... yeah, I mean, they could ask you that question just as good as me, but, you know, um, and, and frankly, today, I don't really know for certain. Back when I was 
I was um, around like up until 2007. Dave lived between Gold, which he doesn't go there anymore, as far as I understand. His apartment next to Author Services and his apartment at the Hacienda Gardens in Clearwater. And right. then there was, a, you know, rooms for him at St. Hill and in Europe and, you know, various other places. But those were the primary places he lived. And his entourage consisted of Shelley, <laughs> always, yeah. was with him all the time. Yep. And Lou, always, Larice Stokenbrock was with him all the time. Right. And there was a collection of people that sort of provided various services to him. Yeah. Uh, Georgiana Irons, um, Valerie Light. Uh, yeah. Just a, a kind of people. Yeah, well, that, that, that's what basically I know, too. And they, uh, he had a chef. I think the guy's handle was Frenchy. Yeah. Remember, he remember that Sinha was this chef originally, Sinha Palmer, right. who Sinha was Alan Hubbard's chef, and yeah. uh, then Frenchie took over, whoever that guy was. I didn't even know who he was. Yeah, well, I met him, and he was very and, nice. And, you know, Stephen Price would follow him around to do his back adjustments. And, right. You know, just... He, he had the entourage. Was the like... hairdresser. And what now? Levon used to cut his hair, and right. Mr. Lim made his clothes, and John Lobb made his shoes. Wow. Shoes at 1500 bucks a pair. Yeah. <laughs> and that was a discounted price, sir, probably 2003. He gave me. Have you ever been to that store in London? John Lobb and Co.? No, I've never been there. Next time you're in London, Ronnie, go there. It's, it's astonishing. I'd, I'd like, love to go there. Nothing's changed since Charles Dickens strolled out of the door. I'll bet. I'll bet because they – look, at there was a fish and chip shop in East Grinstead, and the same people that were working there when I went there like 30 years later, you know. Okay, next okay. question. Next. Karen Cookson just uh, for $20 says thank you for all you're doing to both of you. It's Karen. Thanks, Karen. Well, Karen, I want to give you an acknowledgement for that, and uh, I can speak for Mike. I'll tell you. It's something that we both want to do. It's not something that we've been assigned or somebody said, hey, you better do something about it. No, this is a self-determined decision. Mm -hmm. And I appreciate very much uh, your acknowledging that. And uh, thank you for and, and something I just want to say, Ronnie, is that the people who are out there that support this, your channel, yeah. my blog, the Aftermath Show, Ortega, wherever, they are incredibly valuable. It yeah, I know is, that. It is what makes it all worthwhile yep. when I get a comment on my blog or an email or something on Twitter that says, you know, I just wasn't aware of what was going on, or even better is, oh, my God, I used to be, believing that this was the my only path and now I've found the truth and or I reconnected with my family member whatever that's what makes this worth doing yep you're right Mike yeah, and and it's I'm, I'm thankful for the same thing buddy go on uh open my eyes 67 for 20 says thank you for all you do we are all behind you it's nice Spider fight, uh, $2. No, wait, just let's, let's acknowledge that because oh, absolutely. when I get a, a comment like that, I, I start to choke up a little because it's, it, it's, as I said just a minute ago, it's something that I want to do, and Mike feels the same way, I'm sure. Yep. Really? Um, they call me drums ass. Uh, was LRH as brutal in applying Scientology as David? How much does David personally benefit from the money he raised? So we just talked about him having a shoemaker. So yeah, he's uh, he lives a, a lavish life, a very uh, well the life of a guy who has millions of dollars. I'd say, wouldn't you say that, Mike? Yeah, sure. But understand, he doesn't need to have it personally. I mean, he does have personal money, but he doesn't need to have it personally. And realizes it's a liability to have it personally because yep. the IRS could come after him. He yep. can snap his fingers and has three billion dollars at his disposal. I That's know the best of all worlds. You don't need yep. and, and truthfully, 
you know, people ask this all the time. Well, how come the IRS didn't go after him? You know that that uh, religions in the United States have got a pretty good deal. Yeah. You know, the the leaders of some of these, like Creflo Dollar and and those sort of guys, Joel Osteen, they live in ten thousand square foot homes and have their own private jets. Yeah. Personally, and it's acceptable to the IRS. So. Yeah. The, the, the real issue with David and how he lives, which is sort of the same issue as L. Ron Hubbard, is there is one person who lives like a king and everybody else lives like a pauper. You're right. And that's what, and, and supposedly everybody is here on the same terms. We're all Sea Org members together. We all have the same commitment, except for one. Originally, it was Hubbard who yeah. lived very lavishly, and it does. It's okay to live lavish. There's nothing wrong with that, as long as you're not insisting that everybody else live like a shit eater. Yeah, and that's right. the difference. I won't add anything to that because that's the truth. Yeah. Go on. Uh, Y'all ain't right. So it's for twenty dollars. Says thank you so much for everything, especially the trumpet lesson. Um, <laughs> well, at least she was watching. <laughs> See, <laughs> See, there's one person who appreciates me being a teacher. Yeah. <laughs> there was uh, some good questions of conversation about Tommy Davis. What happened to Tommy Davis? Well, he, he's out of there right now. He he's uh, he says he's on leave from the Sea Org. That's bullshit, man. Yeah, I blew it. He's, he's he he blew and he's he's working a real estate business or I don't know maybe guessing uh, that's, a long, that's a long story. Yeah, we'll, I, I we'll don't even want to get into that one. one. Yeah, yeah. I mean, he, he could be guessing weight at carnivals. I don't know. I yeah. don't care. Well, and uh, the other one um, is I, I don't even know if Mike can comment on this about the Danny Masterson episode. Do we want to uh, even get into that? It's to be. It, it's still to be determined when. Okay. Okay. Yeah. Not my, it's not, I mean, if it was just my decision, it would have been a year ago. So, yeah. Yep. Yeah. Yeah. Okay. Thank you, everybody. And thank you for watching and continue to watch. Become a Patreon. You can become part of the team that's doing something about it, just like that. And follow Mike on his uh, blog. Uh, something can be done about it. And, um, I look forward to having you on again, and that that's going to be announced. Okay, Mike? All right, buddy. And I appreciate you coming on, buddy. Thanks a lot. So this is Life After Scientology. I'm Ron Miscavige, and see you on the next episode. Bye-bye now.